We read about the uh, dreams of Paro, Pharaoh, who's the monarch of the greatest civilization of that time. And first he dreams seven healthy, heavy fleshed cows come out of the Nile. Seven. And then another seven emaciated, thin fleshed cows come out of the Nile and they stand alongside the seven good looking, heavy fleshed cows. And then he sees how the seven emaciated cows swallow up the seven healthy looking cows. And it's as if they never swallowed anything. What is this? What does that signify? So as we see later, the seven healthy cows signify seven years of bounty. Bounty, as we will read later, it's beyond anyone's comprehension, the level of bounty that existed in Egypt. The seven years of famine, the seven emaciated cows represent seven years of famine. Of a level of famine that if not for Yosef being the overseer, of the distribution of the grain, the country would have perished through starvation. And he was the sustainer of the world because the famine not only affected Egypt, all the surrounding lands were affected by this famine. And as a result of this, the wealth of the world had come to Egypt. And Yosef being the person of the ultimate level of integrity, he stored away this wealth on behalf of the Egyptian government. So all the wealth of the world was in Egypt due to the famine. Egypt was more than the breadbasket of the world. All the sustenance to sustain and maintain the world was Egypt. And Yosef dictated that existence because everything was determined by, it was his decision. What did the emaciated cows what did they represent? It says they stood alongside the healthy looking cows. So Rashi himself explains that the emaciated cows eating the healthy looking cows, what does that signify? So Rashi simin shetei kol simchas tasovin shkachas, that the joy of the years of bounty will be forgotten at the time of the famine. Meaning the famine is gonna be so extreme, there's gonna be no recollection of the years of bounty. That's how extreme it's gonna be. It's like a man that's wealthy, has phenomenal wealth, and he goes and he loses it all, and he has no memory of the good days whatsoever. It's as if he has amnesia. It's totally erased from his recollection. That's how extreme they can be consumed with the famine. So I had a difficulty. The Chazal, the Midrash says, should they call simchas hasova nishkachas rov. The joy of the bounty will be forgotten during the years of famine. Should have said the bounty will be forgotten. What does it mean the joy of the bounty? Simchas Hasova, the joy of the bounty. How do we understand this? Bounty, it'll, they'll be so consumed by the famine that they don't understand how they could survive the good days, the days that they were secure. It's as if they never existed. But he's pointing out, Chazal point out, Simchas Hasova. The joy of the bounty. What does it mean, the joy of the bounty? You know, one's predicament very often is, be, is this really a state of mind. Everything's a state of mind. You have a person who's an optimist, you have a person who's a pessimist. What's the difference? It's a state of mind. Do you see the cup half full or do you see the cup half empty? What do you focus? It's a state of mind. You have two people, person can have everything in the world, but he's actually, he's miserable because he doesn't appreciate what he has and therefore he's miserable. 
Another person has very little, but because he's satisfied, he, he feels he has everything. He needs nothing else. Everything is a state of mind. It's how you internalize and how you experience your own reality. Based on the way you experience your reality, that will determine whether you're happy or unhappy. Okay? Chazal tell us, Ezeu Oshir Hasomech Bechelko. Who is the wealthy person? It doesn't say the wealthy person, person who has sufficient. It doesn't say that. He rejoices, he's happy with his lot, with his portion. So you see that happiness is the component which makes you feel wealthy. I'm a wealthy person. It's a state of mind, being happy. So what is going to be the major impact and effect, negative effect of the famine? the happiness of the days of fam of bounty are going to be forgotten. At least you have those fond memories. That itself is a slight consolation. You're still living with that joy of those good times. But even that simcha of that, it's like a race from your memory. It's a race from your emotion. As a result of that, now you get actually, you're going to stew in your brew and this negative, deprived state, as if the past hasn't even existed. So it's not only in the physical sense, even emotionally speaking, the person has an issue. So what I said was that the Talmud tells us, You cannot compare a person who has bread in the basket the person does not have bread in the basket. And it's a psychological situation. The person has food in the cupboard and you haven't eaten for a day. You may be hungry, but factually it's okay because the food is always available to you whenever you choose to eat because you have food in the cupboard. But a person has one meal and no more than one meal and he has no idea where anything beyond that meal is coming from. Although he has one meal, he's consumed with the worry that he only has, he doesn't have bread in the basket. That worry automatically wears the person down because he doesn't know where, so to say, the next meal is coming from. What's the, what's the future going to bring? But a person has the future before his eyes or the near future, he feels secure. But if you don't have that sense of security, then you're actually consumed with it and actually it disrupts the person's equilibrium and he doesn't function well because of it. That's the level of distraction. So what's going to be forgotten? It's not only you're going to be have a lack of food, but the simchas a sova, even the joy of the sova, it's going to be forgotten. Now, every Shabbos, we say a chapter of Tehillim, where Dover Melch says, Pekudi Hashem Yishorim. The dictates of Hashem are Yishorim, they're straight, they're fair, appropriate. The dictates of Hashem are straight and therefore they bring joy to the heart. So why do they bring joy to the heart? Because they Yishorim. Because they're fair and appropriate, therefore they bring joy to the heart. Now let's understand. We find that the Avos HaKadoshim, the Holy Patriarchs, were called, were classified as Yishorim. They were straight, appropriate, fair people. They maintained an unbelievable level of obje objectivity and they did not get distracted. We find in the Sefer Yoshua, the Sefer Bereshis is referred to as Sefer HaYosher. It's the book of, it's the book of the Yosher. And the Talmud asks, why is it called Sefer HaYosher? Why is the book of Yosher? Because it's Sifro Shel Yishorim. Because it's the book which discusses the lives of the patriarchs who are Yishorim. That's why it's called Sefer Yosher, because the patriarchs are Yishorim. Klal Yisrael, the Jewish people, the major sites of verse, are called Yishorim. We being the descendants of the Yishorim, the patriarchs, we ourselves, the core of the Jew is Yosher. Is Yosher? We'll discuss in a moment. So, if you are Yosher, 
and you are able to address your core. And how do you address the core, which is Yosher, with something which, which, which is compatible with you? What's compatible with Yosher? There's only one other thing in existence, which is Yosher, which is fair and appropriate. Kudi Hashem, you showed him. So what's compatible? Which satisfies the core of a Jew? The dictates of Hashem. Are you shorim? Therefore, Masam Kelev. Therefore, it brings about that level of contentment. And when a human being is content, he has joy. That is the key to, to happiness. If you're content. How do you, how is a Jew content? If he's able to address his core. And what is the core of the Jew? The core of the Jew is Yishorim. Because he's Yosher. There's a verse in Tilim where David Mel says, and we say it every Kabbalah Shabbos, and we say it on Yom Kippur, Ozerul at Tzadik, the light should, will shine for the Tzadik, Uli Yishrei Leiv Simcha, and those who have a straight heart, Simcha, they will have joy. If your heart is straight, appropriate, it's like, you know, we say a person who's normal, he's able to, to really enjoy life. A person has many idiosyncrasies, abnormalities, can't enjoy life. But if you're basically a functional, fully functional person, if there is what to enjoy, that person could enjoy it because he's fully functional. The person who's Yosha Leiv, he has a straight heart, he has Simcha. There's a famous verse in Kohelis where Shlomo Melech writes that originally Adam, Adam was created and he was classification was Adam. Because he ate of the tree of knowledge, which was the fruit of Tovera, good and evil, he was declassified. He was defranchised. He, wasn't, he, he lost the franchise of Adam. Who assumed that posture and that reality of Adam? Atem Kriyim Adam, Vehem Lo Kriyim Adam. The Jewish people's classification is Adam, and they are no longer classified as Adam. And as we explain, name of the Maral of Prague, why was Adam called Adam? Because he was made from the earth. Kimina Adam Alukah, because he was made from the earth. Now, what is earth? Earth itself, the most fertile earth, virgin soil. Its value is only if you take advantage of its potential. If you cultivate it and you plant it, then all life grows from earth. If you leave it as a clump of earth, it remains, you leave it fallow, it's just earth. What is a Jew? A Jew is potential. We have unlimited growth, unfathomable levels of advancement, spiritually speaking. Adam, when he ate of the tree of knowledge, he forfeited that growth aspect of himself. He was locked in that he no longer, he had forfeited the ability to extend, extend himself spiritually speaking, to grow spiritually. Kalal Yisrael assumed that classification and therefore we have positive commandments because the positive commandment is a due command, which is an advancement commandment. Atem kuri modem hem lo kuri modem. Shlomo writes in Mishlei, God created Odom, Ubiksho Cheshbonos Rabos. They sought out all kinds of calculations and they messed themselves up. They really hurt themselves. They became corrupted. Adam thought he'll be do something heroic. What's heroic? A leader of the tree of knowledge. Although now he has clarity, as the Arizal says, because he wants to, to up the ante. By making the challenge greater, now if he succeeds, his accomplishments will be greater. God says, keep it simple. I'm not looking for heroes. You want to be the hero. You lost it. You lost the game. You're declassified. You no longer have that classification of Odom. It's given over to someone else. Who is that? That's Klal Yisrael. The, the descendants of the Ovo Sakadosh, who you showed him. Well, since the Torah is Pekudah Hashem, you showed him only the one who has the characteristic of Yosher does he have relevance to be the Odom. So we we merited the Pekudah Hashem, which you showed him, because we ourselves are Yosher. Proof of the pudding, 
At Sinai, we said, Nasa Vinishma. The Torah was offered to the world. They said, it doesn't fit our lifestyle. It's not consistent with our lifestyle. The Jews, what did they say? They didn't even ask what it's all about. They said, we accept it unequivocally. Nasa Vinishma. Why? Because we were sharing. A person's yosher, if you're saying God offers you something, you don't have to ask what it's all about. God, in the absolute sense, is yosher. That's what Pekudi Hashem is him. Therefore, it's Mesabchilev. That's the joy. So what is the essence of, of life to really maximize it? Simcha is, that is the ultimate achievement. A Jew achieves it through what? Through Torah. That's, as it says, it's Mesabchei Leiv. Material would never give it to you, ever. The only way material will give you that relevance to joy, if it's a means, not an end. If I have the material to facilitate the spiritual, to advance the spiritual, then that, that's the Yisachar's woman equation. That's the partnership. Yisachar was committed to Torah, only to Torah, Zvulna was committed to guarantee and support that and facilitate it to the nth degree. Not to allow Yisachar to be distracted as much as Nyota and to be able to keep advancing himself. So the value of the material was only the spiritual. So if a person invests his life in that context, it brings tremendous joy. Because the sense of accomplishment is, is not to be imagined or to be measured for that reason. So when it says that the bounty is going to be forgotten, you know, a person believes it's, it's, it's forever. It's never going to change. Seven years of bounty. We read that Yitzchok was in Canaan, and all of a sudden Canaan was struck with a famine, and he was going to leave the land. God says to Yitzchok, don't leave the land. You remain here, and you'll have the blessing here. We're talking about it was a year of famine. He planted that year. He had a yield that was a hundredfold of a normal year. Could you imagine? It's a famine year, and the crop was a hundred times the capacity of a normal crop, despite being a famine year. The bounty of Egypt was not imaginable. We read when Yosef gathered the grain, what happened? There was so much grain stored in preparation for the famine, there was no number they supposed Past the number. They had to create new, new numbers. That's how much grain there was. It was unlimited. That's what happened. So what is the value of simcha? To have joy in your life. Joy is actually the, the equalizer. If a person doesn't have joy in his life, it's irrelevant how successful you are, what you accomplish. If you're not touched in the way that you have joy, you're off kilter. So what affected the Egyptians more than anything? It was not only the deprivation, but it was actually, they no longer, the joy of what they had was no longer there. It's very interesting. You know, we have a certain appellation, which it's applied in two contexts. Before Tisha B'av, which we, is the most tragic day in the history of the Jewish people, we mourn, that's considered national mourning for the Jewish people. First and second base. Amidish were destroyed. Beta was destroyed. The generation that wandered and perished over the 40 year period was decreed on that night of Tishabov. And Yushalan was plowed under on Tishabov. Okay? Before we begin the Tishabov, the fast, which is a 24 hour fast, 25 hour fast. We have something known as Sudam Afsekis. It's the meal that precedes the fast. We sit on the feet on the floor and we have a hard boiled egg with bread. We dip it in ash. It's literally eating a meal which we grieve to indicate our about enter into a state of grieving. That's Sudam Afsekis. And we have the same term, Erevium Kipper. When we're about to enter the day, day of atonement, which we're able to relieve ourselves of all our spiritual debt. We have Surah Mavsekis, and it's a festive meal. Of course, 
tone down cutlery, quality food, nothing ostentatious, nothing to be indulgent, but it's done within a context of very formal, very classy. It's the introduction to Yom Kippur. So I had mentioned in the past the name of the Yisod V'Shosh Avoda, based on the, on the Zohar, what are we celebrating? Do you know a person gets a registered letter without a question? He just won the billion dollar lottery, except he has to wait three days to pick it up. And there's no question. He verified it's this is not, it's the real, it's it's the real letter. He doesn't have to wait to have that lottery ticket. He doesn't have to have the payout in his hand. He's already celebrating even before he arrives there because he knows what's waiting for him is this amount of money, which is unheard of. It'll change his life. It'll change many other people's lives. Understanding what the value of the day is, Tisha of Yom Kippur, that if you utilize the day properly, guaranteed, you'll be inscribed the day of, in the book of life. All your debt, you'll be relieved from your debt. And you relate to that, and you value that. What are we talking about? This goes beyond the billion dollar lottery. This guarantees you a share in the world to come. A life free of whatever is negative. We're celebrating in advance. That's what the Surah Mavsekis is. Now we enter into the day, the five areas of deprivation. No eating, no drinking, no bathing, no anointing, no cohabitation, not permit to wear leather shoes. And it says you should afflict yourself, affliction. And it's already Yom Kippur in the afternoon and you really feel the pangs of hunger. So what do people do naturally? They look at their watch and the, they, they, they're counting the minutes or the hours until it's going to be over with. So the Shod Vashur Shavodu writes, based on the Zohar, every moment of a sense of affliction, pain, deprivation, that feeling is a fulfillment of the commandment of your afflicting yourself, your kipper, and that is part of payment of the debt. So rather than seeing it as we can't wait till it's over, that's the rehabilitation process. That's the reinstatement process. So what you see as a negative and as deprivation, as painful, that pain is gain. That pain is the ultimate. That's exactly how you're relieving your debt. You're paying off a penny on a trillion dollars and God is willing to take it. And you're good for the money, literally. God says you committed, you're there. You're back in the fold. You're protected, guaranteed my blessing. So what state are we where we're experiencing the affliction? Are we in the state of joy or are we in a state of angst? Although physically we feel hungry, we feel tired, we feel fatigued, we feel parched. But understanding the value of that, that's joy. I remember I had a grandmother, Allah Shalom. She lived till the age of 95. She had many, many grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren. And in an old age, she had a very serious arthritic condition. She writhed with pain. But she said, when I see my grandchildren and great-grandchildren, I have joy, I have simcha. It's like the pain doesn't exist. Life is not having pains. That's what life's all about. Life is accomplishment. Life is value. And if you see value before your life, before your eyes, and you see accomplishment, everything else is totally irrelevant. That's joy. But if you see joy is only the material, and you don't meet the grade of what you think you should have, you have no joy. There's no simcha. If you have no simcha, the person goes into the grave. And a, a happy man, an unhappy man died. Many years ago, I was asked, there was a family, Jewish family, 
traditional, not observant. And they were, the father was a multi-billionaire. The wife must have been 15, 20 years younger than him. And today they have charity advisors where they advise families where they meet with the, with the husband and wife and the children exactly how they can, the families can give charity. Okay? So this woman flew up from Atlanta, Georgia to advise the family. And I, as a rabbi, was asked to come to give an int introduction, the Torah perspective of charity. And we met in a meeting room at the Essex House. And what I saw was, and the father says to the children, I want to die. When I die, I want to be the poorest man in the cemetery. Those were his words. Man is a billionaire. I want to be the poorest man in the cemetery. That means before he dies, he really, really, he wants to bequeath everything and give it over that his children, that he no longer has control over his assets and they should distribute it. I could tell you, I was there. I never saw anything like it in my life. The level of disrespect that this man's children had for him, the way they spoke to him, he may want to, he may be, die the, the most unhappy person if these are the kids you raised, and we're talking about kids who went to Ivy League colleges in their early 20s, not a, 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 an iota of appreciation for what the father provided for them, and they had nothing lacking in their lives, probably unless, uh, except for happiness, and a wholesome, functional family, and he wants to die the happiest man, the, the poorest man in the cemetery. He'll die, and we died, he wasn't a happy man. I'm not sure... Poorest, I'm not sure. I gave them an hour of my time, okay? Do you think, even after I gave them an hour of my time, do you think they even said, the mother and the father, do you think they said thank you? Thank you, not a thank you. Do you think they sent me a, a card just of appreciating what I did? I'm not even talking about, I didn't do it for any financial payment. Not even a thank you, you understand? Now you understand why those children were the children they were. As you know, as they say, what, what goes around comes around. The way you treat others, you have it in your own backyard. And that's what it was all about. There was no joy. There was no simcha in that family. Because simcha for a Jew especially is only when it has to do with yishorim. When you touch the core, and the core of the Jew is that, is the Torah, which is yosher, or that's or the Zerul Atzar Ul Yishrei Leif Simcha, the one who has the straight heart, and that heart is is nourished with something which is Yosher, which is Pekudi Hashem, Yishorim, it's Masab Chilev, then you truly have joy. Because then you've come upon what, what your essence is, what your core is all about. Then you're content with your life. And you can have very little, and you have happiness. And you can have it all, and you're actually you're miserable. And you're still looking for the glory, which you'll never find. We find that Yosef spent 12 years in prison. And why did he spend an additional two years in prison? Because he was the valet of the two ministers of the king, the wine steward and the baker, and he interpreted the dream of the wine steward, which the interpretation was accurate, and the wine steward understood it, and he made a request. He says, you should remember me and mention me to the king that I'm innocent, I shouldn't be here, I was accused, and the Torah tells us, as soon as he was reinstated, to be the wine steward, forgot about Yosef, totally. So because he put his faith in the heathens, made some versatility, for that, you're going to pay the price. Another two years in prison. For each word, another year in prison. And he learned his lesson well. Okay? Now, finally, the king has a dream. And he dreams the dream we spoke about. The seven healthy-looking cows, the seven emaciated cows, one devours the other, 
the effect is not even noticeable on the emaciated cows and seven sheaves of wheat, of grain, on one stalk, and so on and so forth. Paro causes all his interpreters. Nobody gives a satisfactory interpretation. Finally, the wine steward, he pipes up. And he says, I admit my sin. I was in prison, and there was this Jew with us. And when he depicts this Yosef, who interpreted his dreams, it's the most derogatory, denigrating, shameful, disgraceful context. That's how he describes him. And he interpreted the dream. And how does he refer to him? He refers to him as, and he tells him, we had this person, me and the baker, and he interpreted dreams exactly. And as he interpreted, that's exactly what happened. I was reinstated. He was hanged and so on and so forth. And he says, who is, he, who is this person with us? He was Nar Evidivri. He was, a Nar means a fool. He was a slave. And he was Ivri. What, what did each depiction represent? So Rashi cites the Midrash as an introduction. The man did you such a favor. It's bad enough that you didn't show any appreciation. But now that you're finally presenting him, his capability, why disgrace him? Why denigrate him? Why paint such an ugly picture of who he is? Nar, so Rashi introduces it. Arurim harushoim, cursed of the evil, shein tovosim shleimo. That even when they do the good thing, it's lacking in wholesomeness. Maskiro beloshim bizoyo. He's mentioning him in a context which is the right. Obligatory, disgraceful, ugly. He's saying it's safe, right? First thing, Yosef was a handsome man. He wasn't just an ordinary person. And the wine steward, being a minister, he appreciated his capability. So he, but still, I ruin the show him, curse it in the evil. Even when you do something good, you can't even do it right. It's all soiled with all this bad stuff, as they say. Nar, what does Nar mean? Shote. He's unstable. He's an unstable person. Vein Roy Lugdula. And therefore, he doesn't have the capacity to any status of greatness. Nar, Ivri, Afilu Shonene Namakir. He doesn't even reckon, he can't even speak the Egyptian language. Evid, he's a slave. And it's written the protocols of Egypt that a slave cannot be a minister in the court of Pharaoh. So he just cut the feet from under him. He's unstable. He doesn't speak the Egyptian language. And what? And he's a slave. So being a slave, pedigree-wise, he can never rise to any official office, okay? So let's first understand. Firstly, we know Yosef spoke 71 languages. He was well-versed, fluent in 71 languages. So this question, first, how did he all of a sudden know 71 languages? So the Gemara tells us, the Talmud tells us that God sent Gabriel the archangel before he was released from prison and he taught him 71 languages. Hebrew, he spoke. Egyptian, he picked up a little bit. But to be fully versed in every one of the languages, Gabriel the Archangel taught, taught him all 71 languages. According to the Balaturim, when he went and he was purchased as a slave by Potiphar, Gabriel had come there and taught him 71 languages. In addition to Hebrew, he was well versed in 70 languages. So he knew 71 languages. Yosef. So if the man, when he, when Yosef spoke to him in prison, he spoke, you speak about the king's Egyptian, like the king's in English. And yet he says, the man doesn't speak our language. At best he speaks, you know, like what they used to call pig Latin. You know, that's what he speaks. He doesn't speak appropriate English. 
But how could you say such a thing? The answer is because he wants Paro to keep him at an arm's length that he shouldn't even actually, there should be no communication between the two of them. If there's me any communication, it's going to be through an interpreter. Of course, the, the wine steward, being a minister, he's already classified him as a person who cannot speak the language. He's unstable. That means he's not normal. And he doesn't have the pedigree. So he doesn't even, he's not even worthy to stand in the king's presence. So why is he here? To interpret your dreams. Okay. And from here we see the takeaway is Aruri Mishoyim, cursed are the evil, that even when they do something good, they can't do it right. So let's understand. Let's talk from the steward's vantage point. The wine steward on the steward Yosef was. He had relevance to greatness. He knew he had, he had languages under his belt. He spoke languages like nobody spoke languages. He had an astuteness and an ability, which was one of a kind. The warden had given him over in the prison. That nothing happened to prison, only was under the dictatorship of Yosef. So we're not talking about an ordinary person. And he knew the history. Originally, he ran the household of Potiphar, who was a minister. And the success was beyond anybody's imagination. So we're talking about somebody who's gifted in a context beyond anybody's imagination what gifted means. Now, Yosef asked him to do, do him a favor. Mention me. Remember, he mentioned me. What happened? He walks out of prison. He turns his back on him. And his attitude was, let him rot in the dungeon. I couldn't care less. Now, if Yosef is released now, and he, re, and he rises to any level of power, what's the life of, of the wine steward worth? It's worthless. He will take revenge. He'll end his life immediately. I suffered two years in prison because you're an ingrate. Because if he would have any, had any degree of, of gratitude, he would have remembered me and mentioned me. So why did Yossi spend another two years suffering in prison, in the dungeon? Because the wine steward is a bad person. He's an evil man. So for the sake of self-preservation, the wine steward has no other choice but to depict him in the most negative light that Yosef should not be able to rise to power. Because Yosef's rising to power is the equivalent of the death sentence for himself. So why is there a claim against the wine steward? And the takeaway is, cursed are the evil, because even when they do something good, they can't do it appropriately. Because look the way he depicts him. Anybody who's responsible to himself, that's why he would do the same thing. So why didn't, so why is he criticized to such a de degree? This question bothered me. Now, Moshe Rabbeinu tells the Jewish people the name of Hashem before he passes away, that when you come to the promised land and you're going to have tremendous financial success and you're going to become secure, you're going to be susceptible to say, that's the power and my own act acumen brought this about. It's me, it's not God. And your heart will become swollen. And you can forget about God. It's like a person says, thank God, I don't need God. Yeah, they're those kinds of people. Self-made man. And Moshe forewarns the Jews that before you start tasting the bounty and success of life, I'm forewarning you Everyone has that vulnerability to go there. Therefore, keep it in mind. Not to go down, down that slippery slope, okay? A person's in Russia. A person's truly evil. What does he believe? There's an expression in the vernacular. It's called a doggy dog world. The dog goes after, the dog goes after the dog. It's survival of the fittest. And that's the way you have to live your life. Because if you're not there first, you're the last moment, you're the low man on the totem pole. Therefore, you have to go for the jugular vein, as they say. That's the Russia. The Russia is it's me, it's I, and I determine my own destiny. The person who's a tzaddik says, No, whatever happens to me, I take my I take initiative for whatever the outcome of 
that initiative. It's because God wanted to be that way. And that's his understanding of divine providence. It's God's world. And I'm only here to do what I'm supposed to meet challenges. But all the amenities of life, as they're doled out and they're bestowed, it's the way God wants to bestow those amenities. That's the way it is. Okay? If the wine steward would have appreciated who Yosef was, there's no basis for revenge. Yosef understood why was he forgotten? Why was he left to rot for another two years in, in the dungeon? Not because the wine steward forgot about him. Because since he failed and it was considered a lack of faith, by using those two words, that's why he was in prison for those additional two years. If the wine steward would have understood Yosef's mind, that's not even a basis to take revenge. Because this is God's doing, raining on Yosef to teach him the lesson, what it means to have a lack of faith. So if the wine steward would understand Yosef, he'd present him in the appropriate manner, context, brilliant well-versed in language better than anybody who works the face of the earth, capable beyond anybody's capability. So why is he in the self-preservation mode? Because he's a Russia. A Russia is whatever I have, it's because I did for myself. It's unrelated to God. That's, I rule him to him, not because he's depicting him. A person's a Russia, that's his processing mechanism. It's wolf with the contact, it's me and I, if that's the case, he, he understands Yosef in the same context. If that's the case, he's coming after me. Because he doesn't understand how Yosef the Tzaddik, how he internalized and processed this, this is unrelated to the wine steward, why he spent the other two, another additional two years in prison. That's the understanding. If I were to show him not only the wine steward, any Russia, would do the same thing. But because Yosef understood who the wine steward was, he knew exactly how the wine steward depicted him. Unstable, illiterate, lacking pedigree, not to give him a chance to rise to power. Because he understood the mind of the wine steward exactly what he believes is going to happen if he does rise to power. So what happens when Yosef is, comes out of the prison to interpret the dream? And Paro says to him, I heard that you have the capability to interpret dreams. What's Yosef's response? Bilodoy, no, it has nothing to do with me. I have no capability. Elakim, God will bring peace to Paro. God is the one who interprets dreams. I'm purely a pastor. I'm only a conduit. Me, I have no capability whatsoever. How did the wine steward, how did he want Paro to understand who Yosef was? So there's a classification of person, it's called a savant. What's a savant? This is a little light word, you know, there was a person, Liberace, he was a famous pianist. I'm not sure what his intellect was outside of playing the piano. But if you looked at, the, at him, he looked like a madman, right? You know, the way he looked, Maybe he was a savant, piano, one of a kind of a pianist. How he added numbers, I'm not sure. Or other areas. Meaning, genius in this particular location. He can interpret dreams, nobody can interpret dreams as, as, as this man. But he's unstable, he's illiterate, and he has no pattern pedigree. He has every strike against him. One thing he can do, he knows how to pump gas. Nobody can pump gas and do an oil change like this guy could do an oil change. No, that, that's this man. If that's the case, then he doesn't have a chance to rise to power under any circumstance. But Yosef presents it as who he is. It's not me, it's God. And immediately power understands this is the correct interpretation. But what, what does Yosef do? He, when, as there's an expression, when the iron is hot strike, he immediately gives him the solution immediately. How to deal with the issue. So if you have seven years of bounty and seven years of famine to the point where there's not going to be a trace of that bounty initially remembered. 
So how do you deal with it? He immediately gives the solution. How to gather the grain. One person should oversee it all and store it and so on and so forth. And that will guarantee the country should not perish in a state of famine. Paro being the most, the greatest monarch in the world, when he sees talent, he appreciates it like nobody sees talent. You know, when Warren Buffett sees a man who knows Wall Street better than he does, he understands that this man knows what he's talking about. When Paro hears Yosef giving the, the solution, how he would deal with it, it's beyond doubt that's the only way to go. Immediately. He points him to the viceroy, takes off his ring and gives him the ring that the, the, the country is only under his dictate. The coach, he's given the coach of the viceroy that his coach rides next to his coach, next to his chariot, within moments. And what does he say to his advisors? Have you ever seen, we're talking about a man's a pagan. Have you ever seen anybody with the spirit of God within him? His intelligence surpasses human intelligence. He has divine intelligence. To be able to come up with a solution within moments, how to deal with the famine and how to preserve the land, that the land not only will not perish in through starvation, but we will have the wealth of the world because the whole world will come here to purchase grain. This is beyond anybody's imagination beyond anybody's genius because he is the domicile for God's presence and he only speaks God's genius. Therefore, he's the one who will be the viceroy. That's how it happened. But it's only because Yosef understood it's not me. God will bring peace to Paro. It's not my capability. It's an endowment I only speak God's words. And every moment that I have clarity, it's because God gives me that moment of clarity. That's what it's all about. There's a story, we'll just end with this. Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, who was known as the leading Torah sage of his generation. He was the leading, he, he was the greatest orator as one of the Torah sages of his generation. He had the greatest impact on his generation. He established the Muslim, Muslim movement. And so Salanta's genius was one of a kind. And he had a son who had similar genius. And Rabbi Sol Salanta made a mistake and he sent his son to study at the university in Petersgrad. And his son was a mathematical genius. And he was as anti Semitic as the Tsar was. The son of Rabbi Salanter won the award in, in quantum physics because he came up with certain, wrote a thesis, which he brought to another level, okay? So his son became irreligious. His son was not a religious man and it pained him to no end, Rabbi Salanter's son, because he thought that his son is able to actually deal with both sides of the equation. And he did not, he was drawn in, okay? So he had most of his colleagues in the university, and he was a doctor, doctorate of whatever he was, mathematics. He had many colleagues, most, they were all non-Jews. There were no Jews in the university. A Jew wasn't even permitted to go to the university. He was the exception because he had such a level of genius. And he always spoke about his father of being one of a kind of a genius. So they said to him, are you kidding? Your father's a, a archaic man, backward, doesn't even know what the world's all about. And he took it very personal. He says, you think so? You've been working on a, th a thesis for the past three years. You present the, the, the problem to my father. Within five minutes, he will sketch it on a piece of paper. He'll give you, he'll write the thesis for you. Man, it's impossible. So they traveled to Vilna. That's where Rabbi Shosalata was. This Gentile comes in post-doctorate person, maybe had a few other doctorates. This is before they had patents, okay? And he comes in and he presents, he, Rabbi Sol, his son says to his father, this is his colleague, this and that. And 
I want him to appreciate who my father is. And he says to the Gentile, present the, the issue to Rabbi Salanter. He presents it. So Salanter takes a pen, a quill, with a piece of parchment. Within five minutes, he sketches everything. That's the solution. That's the way to go. The man nearly passed out. Nearly passed out. Where does he have this level of genius? Rabbi Salanter, he didn't become what he became because he had no capacity. He had a capacity which surpassed everybody in his generation, except he fully invested it in Torah. But in terms of his capacity, what takes other people years, or they may never ever figure it out, he figures it out like a blink of an eye. You will see that a level of genius, because of his connection to God, it was divine, it was divine genius. And even power of the pagan understood this surpasses paganism. And therefore he says, he is the right man and he will be the one to become my viceroy. He is the key to my success, not only to guarantee the country will survive, but will be the wealthiest civilization in the history of this world. Of course, all the wealth of the world is coming to Egypt. But little did he know, they were only the treasurers for the Jews, because when they left Egypt, they were taking it all with them. Right? That was the rude awakening that when they left, they left him totally impoverished. And the wealth that they had on the chariots, which was the spoils of the sea, that was in addition to what they had taken out of Egypt. We'll stop here to be continued. Well, thank, you. thank you, brother.